The Prince Siobhan Distinguished Lecture sh Series has a wonderful history here at HBU, and we, if you will look at your program, you'll see that uh, we have a, a fabulous lineup of speakers down through the years, and tonight could well top them all. Uh, it's not my uh, privilege to be able to introduce Terry Looper. Someone else uh, will do that later, but uh, Terry, so good to have you and Doris here and quite a few friends. Uh, let's see, Kim and Doug uh, Ferguson are here and the Hunts, Jim and Martha Hunt, and of course Claire and Oscar Turner. Uh, Claire and Oscar Turner represent uh, the uh, family uh, for which the Prince Siobhan uh, lectureship was named. Uh, Harry and Hazel Siobhan wanted to, uh, uh, Claire's parents, wanted to honor their parents. And so they endowed uh, this particular lectureship here at HBU. And, and as you can see, uh, we have had many, many outstanding speakers who have come to us uh, through, this, uh, through this Prince Siobhan lecture series. So glad you're here. I'm reaching into my pocket right now because it's a reminder to me to turn off my cell phone. And I know that all of you are already done that, I'm sure. I'm remembering to do that because just this last weekend, we had a fabulous concert here. Uh, just behind me, uh, you'll see the Sherry and Jim Smith organ, which was dedicated this last Saturday and Sunday, and then the stained glass, the chancel window with the cross in it is, is behind us, and we also had that dedicated. So we've had some wonderful uh, experiences here just in the last uh, few days in this very room and tonight will be no exception to that. We're really glad you're here, and I know that you'll be blessed from hearing uh, Terry Looper this evening. I want to call upon the uh, Dean of uh, the School of Business here at HBU, Mohan Karuvala, uh, pleased to uh, carry on our program. On behalf of the Business School, I would like to welcome all our guests, faculty, and students. I want to thank Mr. Looper for graciously accepting our invitation to share his words of wisdom. And also, once again, thank and Claire and Oscar Turner for their support for this event. This evening is very important to us. I'm often asked, how is the HBU Business School different? My answer is that all business schools can provide education, and functional expertise in management, marketing, finance, accounting. But at HBU, the business school, in addition to all that, we are uniquely poised to provide ethics grounded on faith, as well as convey the concept of globalization. The globalization piece, I leave it alone. We do that through different avenues. But this lecture and the Center for Christianity in Business, which is part of the School of Business, those are ways to influence you, the students, on ethics. Students, it is my hope that when you graduate from HBU, your experiences here would have influenced you to carry ethical behavior into the corporate world. Please join me to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening and for bringing Mr. Looper to our midst. It is my prayer that his words impact these young minds so that they become better corporate citizens of tomorrow. Thank you for making this evening possible. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I now request uh, Dr. Rusty Brooks, the Prince Chevan Chair of Business, to come and introduce the speaker for the evening. Well, it's my privilege to be with you this evening to talk to you not only about the speaker, but to also let you know just a little bit of history about the Prince Chevan Chair in Christian Business Ethics. It was Harry Chevan's dream to provide a system that students could be reached to talk about business ethics, particularly Christian business ethics. So in 1986 was the first time that someone stepped up on a stage and talked with respect to the Prince Siobhan lecture series. 
in the time that has passed since then, we have had three people who have held this particular chair. Dr. Robert Driver, who is retired from the university, was a professor of finance. Uh, Dr. Sherry Westcott, a professor of accounting, and Sherry is probably in here somewhere, but I have no idea, but I certainly want to recognize her. And for the last 10 years, I've held this particular chair. Um, we have had some changes in the way that people have talked to you as students. For about the first decade, theologians talked to students about business ethics from their perspective as being uh, religious professionals. The next decade, we began to bring in academics who were ethicists, which is always one of those words that's a little bit hard to say, but uh, ethicists who would talk to students not only about the Christian business ethics, but some of the founding principles of ethics uh, as a study and as a field of study in universities. For the last three years, we have gone back to the corporate world, especially because of the dire needs that come from corporations, and, and this is specifically for students from our School of Business. And so three years ago, uh, three years ago tonight, uh, Dan Cathy, who is the CEO for Chick-fil-A, came and spoke with a very, very meaningful message, not only about his organization, but his personal walk with life uh, with hand, hand uh, with uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Last year, Jeff Reeder, part of the leadership team with Northwest Mutual, uh, came and shared his message, uh, which was very different than Mr. Cathy's. And tonight, it's our privilege to have Jeff Reeder come. Uh, the, Jeff Reeder talked to us last year, and tonight, uh, Terry Looper will be talking to you. Terry uh, is uh, a little bit different and will present a different perspective for you. Uh, part of his message will not only be about Christian business ethics, but some information from the oil and gas industry, but also some of his deep beliefs based upon uh, his involvement with his church. Uh, his minister and his minister's wife are with us tonight. Uh, Terry is an active member of uh, Grace Presbyterian Church and is also part of several leadership foundation boards that support uh, the, uh, the Christian message through high schools and through school systems. Uh, has been active in Young Life, uh, has been part of the history of the Houston Christian Foundation, uh, Star of Hope Mission, which several of you have uh, hopefully done some work with uh, in some of your own outreach services. And uh, his wife, Doris, is also with us tonight and uh, will be uh, thinking about the message that her husband is bringing. And part of that message to you will be to think about the original idea that Harry Siobhan brought forward, how to bring a Christian message to you about the idea of business ethics. Mr. Siobhan passed away right about a year ago. Uh, he attended all of these messages uh, over the years that he could until in his uh, latter uh, years with his health failing. We made DVDs, and uh, uh, his family showed those DVDs to him. So we believe that uh, Harry is with us in spirit tonight, and we've saved a chair for him down on the end of the row. And uh, we also will be sending a DVD back to his family, and hopefully they'll be able to get together and appreciate the message that Mr. Looper brings uh, in the name of their father. Terry Looper. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brooks, for your introduction. I, uh, uh, I'm always worried, put, put, put that down there, uh, I'm always worried that one of these days somebody's going to ask uh, Darsh to introduce me, my wife. And she's going to get up here and say, why don't we just open this for questions ra rather than uh, the, all this public uh, thing that we talk about. And she asked, like, uh, go ahead and ask me, you know, what's he really like at home? How does he really treat me? And, you know, does he really walk the walk? So, Dr. Brooks, I really appreciate your gracious introduction compared to what it could have been. Well, this evening I'm going to... Uh, just give you a little background around Texan and just a little bit about myself in the introduction. And, and then I'm going to talk about the three secret weapons. And then um, I'll uh, conclude by challenging you a little bit around, around these. Um, just a little background about my company to give you a, a perspective. <clears throat> it's, um, it's three businesses in oil. It's three divisions in the oil business. Two of them are where we buy crude oil and natural gas from producers. And we then transport it. Sometimes we process it, uh, have terminals, pipelines, 
and things like that and eventually sell it uh, to final end users. And then we have a third business that is a patented business of blending butane into gasoline at uh, various and sundry uh, pipelines, uh, gasoline pipelines and, and gasoline terminals around the United States. So it's been a, um, uh, it's 20 years old. Uh, this past year our revenue was $5, five billion, but we still consider ourselves really a small company uh, uh, because we only have about 140 employees, something like that. Uh, we're private and essentially owned by the management and, and our board. All of my board and all of my management team are Christians, um, and uh, hopefully I am too. Um, we want a little bit of distinction about the company is, is our, we've never sued anybody in 20 years. No customer, employee, or vendor has ever sued us. We've had a few minor um, frivolous lawsuits of people that, you know, I, I, you know, there's always something out there, but uh, I didn't know them and, and um, it didn't end up amounting to anything. Our company has used a major auditing firm every year and it's uh, never had an audit adjustment in, in 20 years. Um, <clears throat> no management person or key employee has ever quit our company and gone to work for a competitor. Uh, we have made a profit the last 19 years in a row, and uh, we have no debt and haven't had any debt around our assets. We do carry debt for credit and inventory at times, but for assets, uh, for terminals and the like, we, we haven't had any debt around that for uh, 17 years. So um, it's, it's, it's a little unique um, in, in a lot of ways, but uh, and just a couple of things on myself, uh, Doris and I were high school sweethearts, grew up in Texas City. We got married when I was, I was 19. We were still in college. And um, uh, we have two daughters. They're married, and we have five grandchildren. Uh, <clears throat> one of the, I guess, the most significant thing of, about my past is five years bef before I started Texan, <clears throat> I burned myself out from over trying in business and, and trying to um, over manipulate whatever people, uh, just over trying. I also actually uh, caught my God, which was money. I sold a company right in the middle of that, and I didn't know God, uh, money was my God, but I, I, I caught that and it was very confusing to me. So <clears throat> out of all this pain and desperation, I uh, got on my knees to this about 25 years ago and, and, and uh, accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Um, <clears throat> after about four years, I guess, is when I, uh, I felt or, or called by the Lord to start Texan and, uh, and try for it to be a unique uh, employer and for me to be a unique leader. So that's a little bit about my background. So, <clears throat> you know, I've entitled this my secret weapons in success, uh, my secret weapons uh, really in business, but I made it a little more generic, but, it, but it'll be around business. Um, and, 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 and honestly, it's because um, very few Christians uh, use these principles in their vocation. So um, I, I, uh, I actually do refer to these often as my secret weapons, and they're not secret at all, but compared to so many businessmen, they just, it, it's, they don't know where and how to really use the Lord or, or have a relationship with the Lord around your business. Um, and it's amazing just how much more profitable and well-run Texan has been um, just um, really trying to surrender to the Lord. And, and I'll get into that some more. Um, let, let me first mention a, a weapon that is not a secret, I think, to essentially everybody in here, and, and that is that real life, real success in life only comes if, if you are a Christian, and and just turning control of your life over to the Lord is really the only way to have to, to feel successful, to be successful, and have minimal minimal regrets later in life. Um, <clears throat> see, while I'm going to be talking about vocational or business success t tonight, true success I in, is measured in relationships and um, uh, eternal fulfillment. That, that's my perspective of it. And also you'll see that these secret weapons really aren't very effective if you're, aren't effective if you're not a Christian. 
Um, and I'll mention one more Christian value that everybody knows is very important, but I, I just want to underscore it, even though it, it's, it's obvious, and that is um, uh, just integrity, trust. We, we all, just a simple analogy, we all know that our family members and our friends, we probably all have some family members and friends that we uh, can't totally trust all the time. And it, you know, it really rocks the foundation of, of how you can have a relationship with them and, and, and how you can't. And it's the it's same way in business, you know, with your bosses, your subordinates and peers. I mean, if, if they don't trust you, you, you got a big problem. And, and so I just felt like I, um, it's not a big secret, but I just felt like I needed to, to, to say this. All right, let me see if, uh, make sure I got this going right. Okay. Well, my first secret weapon is accepting my weakness in all things. And uh, said another way, it's being dependent on the Lord in all things. Um, you know, I, you, you've heard that kind of thing from, from pastors or, or other speakers. And, and, and um, do I do it all the time? Well, of course not. But um, one of the things that uh, Jesus says, uh, I don't know. Which way? Up. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. I knew he was going to say something in a minute. Um, he, in John 5, 19, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. Now that's, that's our Lord. That is a pretty incredible, that's pretty amazing. Uh, and then, of course, it's no big surprise that he goes on. I'm going to just make sure I got this going. Uh, in, uh, later in John there in 15, 5b, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, that's no, that's no real surprise if he's starting off as our Lord saying he can do nothing on his own. Um, so, um, you know, what's interesting here, he, he doesn't refer to whether it's, it's just the big things that, you know, can't do on his own. He, he, he's saying in all things. I mean, you, you, you have to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to help us understand in business, in vocation, in school, it, it, it starts trying to permeate you. Um, <clears throat> one more verse here around in Psalms 127.1, um, unless God builds the house, the builder labors in vain. And, you know, Texan's 20 years old, and another 20 years from now I'll be sitting on my rocking chair, or maybe 30 years, hopefully, and, and, and man, what a... Uh, what a terrible thing if if uh, if you said, man, I built that business and, and, and it was in vain, or I did this in life or whatever, and, and it's in vain. Um, so, you know, what does being weak or dependent on the Lord look like? And it's just the fact that you just got to get in your soul that he does things better than you. He knows better than you. And, and, and you've got to develop a rhythm and a process around drawing on that. Um, I've got a little personal saying. I don't know where I came up with this, but it says, just trust myself. Um, the devil loves me playing God. Um, and and um, i.e. thinking I know best. And, <clears throat> you know, being, being weak or dependent is seeking God's direction and leadership. Even the areas where we think we're, we're very good, we all uh, have some gifts, and we all think we're special and capable in certain areas. But the, the, uh, uh, where I struggle is not drawing on him where I consider myself good at something. Um, and, and um, you know, Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. So um, uh, in... in so I got an example for you, and, and that was back when the company was um, just five years old, we had the opportunity to get a new piece of business that would, would, would uh, make, make us a lot of money, and, but we needed to triple our credit line. <clears throat> and out of that, I had been distributing 20% of the profits out of the company to give away to Christian causes. And I was also convinced this business had really come from the Lord. So I started looking around for an additional bank, uh, our existing banks and an additional bank to, to add to triple this line and found none in Houston. And we're in New York scouring around and, and 
want to find any in, in New York either. And finally, I, I said, you know, I, I, I just, uh, they didn't understand about distributing 20% of the profits at that stage when you're going to triple your business. And uh, they wanted me to stay conservative and leave it in. But because I felt like the Lord had given me this business, I didn't think he'd want me to reduce the percentage in the middle of that. So um, as you would imagine, he, he honored that, and we did find a bank to do that that would allow me to continue to distribute that 20%. And uh, here's a little verse that says, uh, where, where Jesus said, which is amazing to me also in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, we've heard that, but my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Um, you know, so what do you think that would look like if you say, we're not going to, I'm not going to surrender and become weak. And then is, uh, what about, is his strength going to be made perfect? I mean, it, it, he, he says it all over the place on all through the Bible. Well, the second uh, w uh, secret weapon is keeping life and business simple. Um, do I struggle with this? Absolutely. And, and, but do I believe it is a true weapon to success? You need to hear this. I absolutely do. Um, now, Jesus, you know, led a simple life, and he for sure uh, uh, promoted a simple life, but we tend to discount that in today's world 2,000 years later. I mean, there's no doubt even 50 years ago, uh, uh, life was a lot slower than it is today. So 2,000 years is, is tremendous difference. But um, here, here's a, a quote that you, you may have heard, in, in the tyranny of uh, the good is the tyranny of the great. Um, and, and, and I also have a definition of passion. Um, see how I'm doing up here. Not too good. Not too good. I'm going to try this on the back where he told me. Okay, I'm going to back that one up. Okay, we're getting there. I apologize for that. Um, the definition of passion is doing God's calling of the great, not the good. Um, see, I believe unless you keep your life simple, most, uh, most likely you'll miss the great things and end up doing just good things. And that is a big difference of when you look back on your life. You want to be into doing the great things. So how do you do that? One, one thing is a critical rule is learn to say no. Just learn to say no around your vocation or your life or business. And, uh, and, and the way to do that is to never give a simple answer. I mean, I'm sorry, an immediate answer. My tendency is uh, to be helpful or prideful when somebody asks me uh, to do something for them. And... Uh, and so what, I, what I've, uh, over the years, I've clearly regretted way more of my yeses than my noes. And uh, that keeps me from having a simple life to where you can, when your life is going too fast and you, you, you go through various seasons of, of this, you know you don't think as well. You just don't. You know you're more anxious. I mean, it, it, it uh, and when you, when you have a simpler business, um, it makes a big difference. So what do I do? I try to always wait a minimum of 24 hours before I give an answer. Um, I actually, uh, when I was asked by Dr. Sloan to, to give this talk, I waited uh, right at a week before I gave an answer. And it, uh, it's because I'm in the middle of selling one of these businesses and, and it's pretty intense. It's about a six-month process, and, and I was already in the process when I uh, decided to commit to this speech. And, and the reason was, the reason it's been a blessing is because it's kept me grounded um, uh, around, by writing this speech, it's kept me grounded when, when I've been dealing with a, a lot of issues around the sale of, this, of one of the businesses. Um, another great thing to remember on keeping life simple is no shoulds, Oughts or have tos. No shoulds, oughts, or have tos. So y'all might like this. Uh, so, some people think the 11th commandment should be don't, do not should on oneself. Um, my, my assistant came in when she typed this up. She goes, 
I, I, you sure this is what you meant? I said, no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, she said, yeah. anyway, she, she wasn't sure about that. But uh, it, it, it's that simple. I mean, we really do decide to do a lot of things that we shouldn't do and feel obligated to do things that we shouldn't do. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of examples around simplicity that have been involved in my life. One is when I started, was wanting to start Texan. Because of my burnout and over trying, I was concerned about starting another company <clears throat> since we'd sold that other one and, um, and not have time for, for my wife and, and my ch girls and, and my relationship with the Lord. So I, I wrestled with this literally two to three years. Uh, it was an awful. One of my friends said, Terry, hurry up and do something. You're killing me. I said, no kidding, man. It's killing me too. Um, and, and so I decided that I felt very called by the Lord to start the company. And I decided that if it's his company and if you're really going to surrender to him, then you don't, it's, it, the number of hours just doesn't really matter. So um, I, I decided to only work 40 hours a week. So that's my number one goal of my company was to work 40 hours a week in starting this. And uh, because I, I was convinced he could uh, do the rest. And it, it's turned out, and, and I continue to do that for a lot of years, well past when my daughters went off to college. Um, another example, six months into Texan, we weren't making a profit. I wasn't drawing a salary, and Darsh really didn't like that part. Um, and I had two crude marketers a approach me from an, a competitor and said, Terry, I, I'd like to join your company. They had a history of making money. They could bring a lot of business immediately. And it's clear that we'd be profitable immediately or within uh, 60, no, probably 90 days. And, and, and I'd get a salary and I'd look good. My company would be profitable. Took it to the Lord and earnestly wanted his will. And it was clear I wasn't supposed to do it. And I actually cried over that because my pride was on the line. I, I was tired of us losing money. And uh, I had to uh, really surrender and did not choose to hire those two guys. Um, it, it, it's a, a little sidebar. Ten years later, one of these gentlemen working for his employer, who um, really is a good guy, but he got to gambling and speculating, and he started losing. He started losing too much, so he started hiding it. And when the employer finally figured it out, they had lost uh, well over a hundred million dollars. Um, so God knows the future, and, and we do not. And His way is even best in business, even though over the short term, like often doing His will, the short term it's not much fun. So the last secret weapon. Now, that one's a hard one to explain, but it's, uh, I think uh, you'll enjoy it, is to be neutral on all decisions. And you go, well, what's that mean? And that's basically just seeking God's will uh, over your desires. Um, and and, and <clears throat> an example, as I mentioned, that we're trying to, Texan is, trying to, is planning on selling uh, this one butane business. And... Uh, over a couple months, I had the board, the management team, and I discussing and praying until we were convinced it was the right thing to do, and more importantly, that that's what the Lord wanted. Now, I don't know if he's going, if it's going up selling or not, and I clearly don't uh, have any idea the amount, but um, uh, we were convinced that we're supposed to try to do that. And so we'll see where it goes. Um, see, God loves the employees more than me. And, and he clearly can see the future, and I cannot. I called on the verse in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, um, and that's trust in the Lord with all your heart, uh, very opposite of culture, and, and do not lean on your own understanding. I mean, it's, it's really um, to, to get that in your soul from your head to your, to your soul is pre pretty amazing. Um, and knowledge of the Lord in all your ways, and he will make your paths straight. That's, that's pretty sweet. You know, back in the 80s, I, I, I was listening to, to a, a tape, and it says, you know, if you really want to do God's will, just uh, do ex exactly the opposite of culture, 
and you'll be right about 95% of the time. You know, and, and, and that's what we're dealing with in business. That's why we have so many problems in business with ethics. Uh, I mean, that's, we're exposed to this every day, every day, and you can't regulate integrity. Um, it, it, talking about um, getting neutral to your own will, let, this is a hypothetical example. Let's say Dr. Sloan uh, knew a gentleman that was very high profile, would be great in his opinion on uh, the, the Houston Baptist Board. Well, um, you know, but d does Dr. Sloan really know, know the gentleman's past? Does, does he really know whether he's got any secret agenda or how he's going to act in the future? You know, he doesn't. Uh, so he's got to get neutral of what he wants to, see, to figure out what, what the Lord wants. Just like me not hiring those two businessmen that, that was going to make my company. And they, they, and they were uh, very above board. Their normal business was very ethical. I had no issues with them as individuals. Um, <clears throat> and, and when you're not neutral, you're, you're biased by definition. Uh, and, and what happens is you, you end up with these filters in front of you where you, you just can't see God's will near as clearly, or if at all. And, and the way that works is, um, let, let's say a gentleman comes up to Dr. Sloan, he says, you know that prospect you're looking at hiring on the board, I, I know a pretty bad uh, situation uh, that he, the way he acted. And if Dr. Sloan has got his filters and, and, and he's biased, he'll say, oh, this guy's always negative. He's always talking bad about people. See, the God's trying to give him a hint, possibly, possibly not, but Dr. Sloan is, is uh, again, this is totally hypothetical. Hopefully we're not, not trying to embarrass Dr. Sloan. Um, uh, but maybe he won't invite me back again to give a speech if, if I embarrass him. But um, so, so the point is, you, you, it takes me uh, weeks usually if not months, to, to, on big decisions, to just get neutral enough to not want, to be willing to consider his will, to do his will if, if he'll point it out to me. Um, you know, another example of this is from Jesus, and um, uh, in, where he says in Matthew 26, 39, my father, if it's possible, We've all know this verse. Let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Um, clearly, as as a human, I think we all believe that he has a personal preference to uh, uh, not want to die on the cross. Uh, from all we understand, of what crucifixion crucifixion's like, um, but yet clearly in his verse he says he's willing. He's definitely willing to um, do God's will, and and he did choose to do God's will, and we know that. You, you know, you just basically got to decide that um, uh, God's way is better. And we got to remember, and we got to figure out a way to sense what that is, and then to have the courage, the discipline and the courage to do it, and do it, and do it again. And it clearly will increase the success you have in business, uh, in your vocation, and, and in life. And by the way, it's very effective. In this being neutral is, is uh, where you really want the Lord's will on a deal more than you wanting it uh, as to whether he, he may want you to have it, he may not want you to have it. Um, it's very, very powerful in negotiating uh, of business deals. It confounds the opposition. You're so peaceful and, and, and you listen better and, and it's... It just works. You ask better questions. Um, the perceived power shifts significantly to your side just because you're trying to not care and yet carry forward until you get a sense of what the Lord wants. It, it takes practice, um, but, but it, uh, it, it is very effective. So in closing, I'd like to challenge you around these three secret weapons. Um, 
If you remember, the first one is to be weak and dependent on the Lord. And so the challenge is um, deciding is over the next week when you have a situation, an opportunity of a problem, um, just decide you want to try to be weak and, and, and see what the Lord will bring. Uh, and the key is so his strength will be made perfect in your weakness. Um, just the key is deciding that he knows best. And that, um, well, the second secret weapon was simplicity. And um, so what we want to do there is, it, it's, what do you want simplicity is in order to, to accomplish the great things rather than the good things. What a blessing. And, it, and so my challenge to you is the next time you receive a request of something to do is just to wait a minimum of 24 hours before you say yes or no. Just that simple. Um, and then the third one is to become neutral in all decisions. And, and so the next time that you have an opportunity where you have a significant decision or any decision that you want to in business or life or vocation is just to seek God's desire over yours and let some time pass. And then if, if you're willing to try that a little bit, then try it again and again, to get a little rhythm. It becomes a little process. Um, see, I've been practicing this, uh, two of these, for over 20 years, and one of them for just three. So I just started really trying to develop one of them at 57 years old. So I'm definitely a work in progress. And so I'm not up here trying to tell you that I've got it all worked out by any, any, uh, in any imagination. I don't think you would necessarily expect a, a, a founder of a, of a company with five billion in revenue to get up and talk about this approach to business, but it works. It also allows you a lot of peace and joy, uh, uh, but it, it, it truly um, is successful, will make your uh, business more successful. So just in conclusion, if you just do these unconventional approaches um, in your vocation or business, since it's business school, you definitely will have less regrets and you'll achieve more success. Thank you very much. Well, uh, she asked if, if you didn't, since you didn't, when you didn't hire those two gentlemen, how did you know it was God's will? Man, that's, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Maybe the hundred million dollar question in, in the case that, that they lost that. Uh, you, you know, uh, I, and I sure was appreciative, whether, whether it's his will or not, I sure was glad I went that way. But, uh, you know, one of my board members says, um, you know, Pray for it to be very clear and to give you a solid answer of yes or no. And he says, you know, I said, well, I don't, kind of based on how you ask your question, in the same way with me, I don't feel Christian enough uh, often to feel like I'm going to know his will. And um, he said, well, that's pretty arrogant on your part. I said, what do you mean that's pretty arrogant? He said, well, you, you, you know, the God Almighty the creator of the universe, if you're genuinely praying for his will and you really want it, that this creator cannot give that to you. It's pretty arrogant that you have that kind of power to block the creator of the universe. And so I'm going, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, I never thought of it quite like that. But, um, you know, it's just a process. It's genuine interest in, in getting... Where I came up with this neutral concept was uh, by a gentleman of a few hundred years ago that, that said 90% of the problem in prayer is you have an agenda that's more important to you than doing his will. It, so getting neutral, with is 90% of the problem is getting neutral to where you're wanting to do his will more than yours. And that's, I started... Um, 
developing that um, um, process. And uh, do I often, do I always get his will in my opinion in terms of understanding it? No. Uh, so hopefully that helped a little bit. I didn't hear it real well, but let's see if I, I can repeat it. And, and out of the three, quote, secret weapons that I refer to, how, how often do I really uh, stick to them, use them versus uh, give up and, 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 and discount the process? Oh, and how hard did I find in the beginning to stick to those? Um, you know... I'm telling you, uh, uh, my spiritual mentor says, never think you have a sin mastered. Um, it's still not easy. Um, uh, it, it's just not. Um, and and um, do I do it every time? Absolutely not. Do I forget? Uh, yes. I mean, all those things. I mean, I'm just as human as everybody in here. But when I do choose to do it, um, and it's, it, it's it, I mean, I, I really try a, a fair amount, um, it, and stick with it, it works. So, yeah, to try at the beginning and where I've challenged you, it, it's not easy. It's not easy. I actually, um, the, the, one of the blessings the Lord gave me back in the 80s when I did this is, is um, uh, I did a bunch of therapy uh, uh, to, to try to figure out why I was so driven um, and, and, and deal with a lot of my sin. And uh, <clears throat> through that, I started getting uh, just the blessings of the Lord. But um, it is not easy. Mr. Lipper, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.